Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay, so last week we began discussing the events and personalities of the Amoraim, the individuals that eventually uh, will contribute towards the codification of the Talmud. Now tonight we're going to go on the next step of this journey, the next station of the story, and analyze the events that transpired that really shaped what the Talmud eventually became. Because we know there are two Talmuds. There's the Jerusalem Talmud, there's the Babylonian Talmud, and the events that we will be discussing tonight will show why the Jerusalem Talmud was doomed and why it didn't really reach what it could have been. It didn't really reach its potential and how the stage was set for the Babylonian Talmud to really, to really just uh, become the fantastic project that it was. We left off last week with two concurrent Jewish communities, one in Israel and one in Babylon, and these were what, what's called in Talmudic parlance, mesiftas. These weren't ordinary yeshivas, places where people went to study. These were centers, establishments, where all the sages got together and essentially would act in ways not unsimilar to the Sanhedrin, where they would be the final venue for Torah law. Now, uh, it's unique, this time period, at least the first hundred years of the Amoraic era is unique because we have two concurrent Mesiftas existing, one in Israel and one in Babylon. And the way they would learn is very fascinating. The, we know that the Mishnah, um, which is was just written at the beginning of this era, is comprised of 63 books, roughly around 60 books. Some of them are very, very small. What they used to do is they would take every single year, each Mesifta would take two of the books, and would spend half a year studying one book, half a year studying the other, the other book, and analyzing and explicating it to such a degree that they were able to fill the body of Talmud and prepare that for its eventual publication. Thus, Rav Ashi, who we're going to meet next week, he is the architect of the Babylonian Talmud, and he headed the Masifta for 60 years, and that's why the Talmud was written during the first 30 years, and the Talmud was rewritten during the next subsequent 30 years, and thus it was edited twice. Uh, Rabbi Yochanan, he uh, was at the helm of the yeshiva in Israel for 55 years, and he too, uh, he went through the Talmud, most of it, twice. And that's why the Talmud has these <coughs> teachings that, um, for example, Rav Ami, Rav Ami is one of the disciples of Rabbi Yochanan, and he's, he would proclaim uh, regarding a particular law in, in the book of Baba Basra 168a, Rabbi Yochanan taught this to us twice, and both times he said this is the law. It means Rabbi Yochanan had 30 years to ruminate about this matter, and he decided, he didn't change his mind, and therefore that must be true. And that's what they would do. To every, every year, two Masechtas, two books of the Talmud, of the, of the, was then the Mishnah, and really build the corpus that's going to become the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, and of course, the Jerusalem Talmud earlier. Now for five months, what they would do is, they'd have a select number of sages in the Masifta, anywhere between 500 and 1,500, around 1,000, who would be there full time. And these were the scholars and sages and leaders and visionaries of the people. And they would spend five years toiling, five months, they would spend five months toiling in that particular Masifta, and the sixth month, that was called the Yarche Kala. That was when the entire nation came together and the entire nation studied that particular Masechta together. Whereas the sages would be there the entire year studying that particular book, the rest of the lay people, if we could even call them that, because if any one of them was transported into our world, immediately would be the greatest sage around, those lay people would spend five months preparing on their own, and then when they got to the Yarche Kal, to the month of scholarship, everyone assembled to the central Masifta, and for a, a, a long month convention where they would study and analyze and explicate 
and analyze and engage in the Talmudic building of that particular Masechta. <clears throat> now, while we have these two concurrent communities, it's important to note that the community in Bavel, in Babylon, was always submitted, it always had the humility to recognize that it was not at the status of that in Israel. Even though, for much of this time period, the scholarship in Babylon outweighed that in Israel by numbers and uh, by quality, still they had the humility to recognize that Israel is still the home of the Jewish people, and thus we are subject to them. So, for example, we spoke about this last week, Rav. Rav was the towering personality of the first generations of Amorim. He was still considered a Tana. He had the status of the previous era, and thus he was the only one who could argue with the Mishnah, despite being an Amora. Yet, when he left to Babylon... He was not granted a certain degree of uh, permission to pass judgment on blemishes of firstborn cattle. And for the rest of his life, despite him being the number one authority and having no one who would stand in his way, in his view, because the scholars in Israel did not convey upon me this right, even though I'm the most gifted at it, and there's no one who could potentially... Uh, you know, stand in the way of me asserting that power, I'm submitted to them. And the reason why is because the Sanhedrin was still in Israel. So, for example, Sanhedrin is a body established by Moshe, and the critical qualifications that you had to have to be part of the Sanhedrin, uh, uh, one of them was that you had to have smicha. Smicha is uh, loosely translated as rabbinic ordination. What it meant is, is that Moshe he put his hands, he did smicha on Joshua. He conferred upon him the status of knowing everything that Moshe knew. And that was the tradition, starting with Moshe to Joshua and all the way throughout the ages. Every teacher who received smicha from someone who received smicha from someone all the way back to Moshe would convey that onward. And in order to be part of the Sanhedrin, you had to have smicha. And smicha meant that you can adjudicate certain laws. For example, you read the first few pages of the book of Sanhedrin, it talks about there are certain laws that can only be adjudicated by judges that had smicha. So when they were in Babylon, the smicha only existed in Israel. Sanhedrin was in Israel. And smicha only existed in Israel. And that's why if you look at the Talmud, there's thousands of names in the Talmud. How do you know quickly if someone was in Israel or in Babylon? You can tell by their name. If they were called Rav something, then they were from Babylon. If they were called rab, rabbi or rabbi, that meant they had smicha, and thus they were part of the, is, uh, the lineage in, uh, in Israel. And despite, it's, what's, it's ironic here, you have the greater Torah community in Babylon, yet they're submitting themselves to the community in Israel, and even though they are the greatest Torah scholars of their time, they would not use the term rabbi, nor would they adjudicate matters that are not uh, to be done by people who don't have smicha, and even the things that they did do out of necessity, the Gemara says that they would declare, how are we allowed to engage in this form of adjudication? It's only because we are the emissaries of the scholars in Israel. It's almost as if they submitted themselves to the scholars and the judges in Israel, they said, we're just, doing, we're being their shliach. We're just the proxy. They're really doing it, and we're just the tool, the vessel that they're going to use. Now, over the first centuries, or the first century, really, of the Amoraic era, there's going to be, uh, you know, shifts between where the absolute center, the epicenter of Torah, between Israel and Babylon. <clears throat> Rav and Shmuel, they came and they established amazing Torah centers in Sura, in Erda, eventually in Pompadisa, and other places in Babylon. When they were there, it was the undisputed center of Torah life. Now, Rav Yochanan, who was concurrently in Israel, he was secondary 
compared to Rav and Shmuel. After Rav and Shmuel died, those institutions that they established went on, but the focus, the leadership mantle of all of Israel went back to Rav Yochanan in the Galilee in northern Israel. He lived a very long, he was over 100 years old, and so this period of 30 years after Rav, uh, after Shmuel died, because uh, Rav died before Shmuel, but then the epicenter shifts back to Israel. And there are some factors that are really going to shake up the Jewish world and this balance of these two coexisting Torah centers that is really going to change everything. Rabbi Yochanan is attributed with the authorship of the Jerusalem Talmud. Now, the truth is, he didn't write it per se, but he oversaw it, just like uh, Rav Ashi, who was the head of the Babylonian Yeshiva that's going to write the, the, the Babylonian Talmud, he is the architect, he is the overseer, but it was written and edited and re-edited for hundreds of years after him. He's not, the, he's not, his, not his writing alone, but he's the overse- overseer of it. Similarly, the Jerusalem Talmud was overseen by Rav Yochanan. But if you notice, if you ever study Jerusalem Talmud, you'll notice it doesn't have an editor. It's almost as if it was written hastily, and what didn't have a chance to be finalized. And the reason why is that after the death of Rabbi Yochanan, there's going to be a tidal change that's going to uh, happen to the next generation, particularly in Israel, that's going to really uh, upend this equilibrium. Uh, there is going to be, uh, specifically, a rise in adversaries. The last time we talked about the Christians... Uh, they were a persecuted, persecuted group or subsect of the Jewish people that didn't really have their place. Over the course of the next couple of hundred years, they really spread and became a very formidable uh, adversary for the Jewish people. And they were going to rise to tremendous heights in the end of the third and the beginning of the fourth century. And then, of course, they're going to merge with the Romans, so the two arch enemies of the Jews are going to marry, and they're going to create a new behemoth that's really going to shake up life for the Jews in Israel. So there's an uptick on one hand of Roman persecution. There's going to be an increase in religious persecution by the ascendant Christians. And of course, very soon, those two are going to merge, and it's going to create a supervillain that's going to essentially destroy the Jewish community in Israel. Uh, moreover, the community did was suff- suffered a lot from abject poverty. Remember, since the times of the destruction of the temple, several hundred years prior, Jews are only living in the north. The Jews are isolated. They're restricted. There's there's increasing laws against them. And even when Marcus Aurelius Antoninus had that brief period where he was friendly with Rabbi Judah the Prince and they were able to do things, all that was clandestine. All that was covert. Their relationship was personal and it was hidden because the Romans' official position was very hostile to the Jews and that was getting progressively worse. On top of that, we have abject poverty in the Jewish community in Israel. For example, the Talmud tells that uh, Romans plundered synagogues in northern Israel and stole the Torah scrolls. And the Jewish communities were too poor to afford to purchase a new Torah scroll. So they went over to the rabbis and asked them, are we allowed to use other scrolls, not a whole Torah scroll, but a scroll that, that only contains the book of Leviticus, for example, is that admissible, is that kosher to be used in a synagogue. It's amazing that kind of poverty that existed that there wasn't even enough funds to supply the most basic uh, Jewish needs. And of course, in the beginning of the 4th century, the rise of Constantine and his embrace of Christianity and where the Roman Empire is essentially going to turn into the Byzantine, the Holy Roman Empire, that's going to cause untold pain and suffering for the Jews in Israel, and it's going to be culminated by horrific massacres under the stewardship of Gallus in the 350s. 
The Christians, as they always were, were dead set on eradicating the Jews and certainly destroying the Torah and Torah influences uh, in Israel. Uh, now, the suffering came in spurts, as it often does, but it reached a climax when they uh, essentially convinced Rome that uh, the Jews have to be destroyed. Now, the Romans were less hostile to the Jews than the Christians were, uh, and frequently the Jews and the scholars would intervene on behalf of these claims and would fight back. You know, not fight back physically, those days are over. The notion of Jewish nationalism is dead. But just to reach out and go to Rome and go lobby and go speak to the people and, and have the scholars of, and leaders of the communities to go try to work on behalf of the nation. Uh, but in the year 351, uh, the Caesar Gallus and his general, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce this, or Sicinus, uh, they, together with the Christians, undertook an effort to wipe out the Jewish population of, of Israel. The entire northern Israel was heaps of rubble, uh, and they especially targeted the place, the epicenters of the Masifta, the Torah study. So at that time, the location where the rabbis were was a city called Tzipori. That was the last place where the Sanhedrin was. And specifically that, they targeted and they absolutely destroyed it. So the rabbis, some of them are slaughtered. The ones that are not slaughtered are trying to escape. They're fleeing, they're scattering, and it's absolute devastation. So Zippori is destroyed, Tiberia, Tiberius is destroyed. A Torah center that existed in Lud and its neighboring towns also were destroyed. The majority of Jews in the land of Israel... Uh, it's still it's a smaller population center than that of Babylon, but the majority of Jews were massacred, and the ones that were able to flee fled. So you ask me the question, why couldn't the rabbis just finish editing the Jerusalem Talmud? And this is your answer. Mm -hmm. The Romans come in, the Christians come in together, and all the rabbis that were working on this project, it's a multi-decade project, to write and to edit and refine the Talmud, they're all gone. And thus, the Talmud that we have today um, is, of the Jerusalem Talmud, it's, it's great, but it's not a finished and polished product because the, uh, the people, the principal uh, individuals that were working on that project had to flee in middle. Now, <clears throat> there's a tremendous deception about this story. Uh, post facto, who wrote the history books? It's always an important question to ask. Who is conveying this message? So if you read the historical accounts of, uh, of this slaughter of the 350s, the way that it will be portrayed is that the Jews sparked a revolt against the Romans. And as a response, they just came and slew everyone. So part of that's true, part of that's not true. They did come and slay everyone, but there was actually no revolt whatsoever. Now, if you look in all of Jewish sources, there's not a single mention of any revolt. And it's not like we hide from writing our revolts, because, by the way, the Bar Kokhba revolt, we admit, freely. Uh, we were not ones to doctor our history and to try to whitewash it. So we write about our revolts, and there's not a single mention of that whatsoever. But moreover, the Jews at that time were tremendously weakened. They didn't, it wasn't like the Bar Kokhba revolt, which is right on the heels of destruction of Judea, and we're still kind of smarting from the blow, and we're thinking about ways to fight back, and we're still a nation dominated by the nationalists. That, that's gone. The Jews are very weak, comparatively, in Israel, and to go up against the Roman Empire is absolutely laughable. The notion is laughable. But moreover, there's actually evidence that it's not true, given that several years later, five years after this, uh, after this massacre, there is a little window where a new, a, a new Caesar by the name of uh, Julian, known as Julian the Apostate, because he didn't fall for the uh, Christian stuff, 
he becomes emperor, and he right away tries to atone for the massacre by inviting the Jews to go build a temple, for example. And he showed unprecedented friendship and overtly to the Jewish people. And if the Jews had just recently revolted, there's no way he would behave as such. So the whole thing is ludicrous. But the, the reason why that story has been perpetrated or been perpetuated is because, well, who wrote the story? It's the Christians, and they were reluctant to reveal that they just, out of sheer butchery and hatred and brutality, that they just came after the Jews. So they just concocted an event, a non-existent revolt, and therefore they used that to justify their heinous murder. And I was thinking that there's actually, this same exact method was used by the spiritual heir of Christian Jew hatred. Of course, that's Hitler. Who was the first victim of World War II? On August 31st, the day before Germany attacked Poland, the Germans went to a concentration camp. They pulled out a petty criminal whose name is unknown. They dressed him in a Polish soldier's uniform. They brought him to the town, to the frontier town of Gliwice, and they shot him. And the reason why is that, you know, the Gestapo, they, on the radio, they announced that there was a Polish attack on the German town of Gliwice. And the following day, when they began their assault on Poland on September 1st, 1939, Hitler gave his famous speech, and he gave his justifications for the war. And one of them was an attack by regular Polish troops on the Gliwice transmitter. That was the justification for the attack. Now I was thinking, we know who won the war. Who won the war? The Allies won the war and the Germans lost the war. But suppose the Germans won the war. This story would be the narrative. The narrative was is that the German army was heinously attacked in a surprise attack on their borders, and they responded. That's precisely what happened over here. It was, it, it was unprovoked. It was based out of sheer Jew hatred that is going to, uh, that is going to embody and is be emblematic of the Christians going forward. They hated the Jews and they hated Torah. They wanted to kill them. Post facto, they concoct a non-existent revolt Who's going to say otherwise? Anyone who would say otherwise is either dead or scrambling. Now, amid the chaos, the Jewish community in Israel is a heap of ruins. There is the rise of Julian, and there is a major development that is really remarkable, and again, a testament of God's intervention in history. Just like uh, several hundred years prior, when the Mishnah needed to be written, because if it wasn't written, it would be forgotten, we find uh, the rise and the emergence of Antoninus as a benevolent friend of the Jews who allows a window for this massive project to be undertaken. There's a similar, a little bit of a more narrow window where a friend of the Jews, an overt friend of the Jews, becomes the emperor. He rises from the low classes and becomes the emperor, and for only less than two years, like 18 months, he is the emperor. He dies in battle. But during this time, there's a major transformation that happens that we still benefit today. And that is with regards to the consecration of the new month. Now, Israel, like we said, was destroyed in those massacres. And... Um, the community is essentially over. But the Sanhedrin, whatever skeletal organization they still had, was still in existence. It was still extant. And they played a pivotal role for the entire Jewish 
world. It's almost like, you know, if we knew the computers that were running the airports, they're, they're still from the 60s, right? And you, you think about how many computers from the 60s are still taking such vital roles in infrastructure in this country. In a similar way, Sanhedrin, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's miles away from its glorious past, but there was one critical role that they played that allowed the Jewish community everywhere to continue on, and that is the consecration of the new month. Now, this is a little bit complicated, but I'm going to explain this in a way that makes sense. There's three elements needed to have a Jew functioning Jewish calendar. Jewish calendar, the Almighty selected for us uh, a hard job. In fact, it's the first mitzvah given to the Jewish people, this week's parsha, chapter 12 of Exodus, the first mitzvah that we're told, as a, not as individuals, but as a nation, is to keep and maintain a calendar. The question is, well, what's the big deal about that, right? You just have a simple system. 365 days a year. Every four years, you add an extra day. Every 100 years, you don't add that extra day. Every 400 years, you do add that. It's just simple. You just follow it, right? And that's indeed the Gregorian calendar is simple because it doesn't really demand a lot of mathematics and calculations. The problem that we have is that we are told to follow a lunar month, yet we have to balance that with a solar year. Our lunar month... Uh, you know, if you mold, if it's 29 and a half days, thus 12 lunar months is 354 days. So if we just follow a lunar month, every year Pesach will be 11 days earlier in the solar year. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if it would be on uh, March 21st on one year, the following year would be March 10th, etc. And eventually you'll have Pesach in the summer, in the spring, in the winter, right? It would just... Yet we're told, again in this week's parsha, we have to always celebrate Pesach in the spring. So that essentially is a demand for us to find a way to balance the solar year and a lunar month. And the way we do that is there's three elements to it. Number one, there is the witnesses. We have the witnesses that come to the court, to the Sanhedrin, to testify they saw the new month. We have to have the announcement, the consecration, Mekudosh, Mekudosh, where they announce it's a new month, it's Rosh Chodesh. And then we have to announce that message and spread the message to all the far-flung Jewish communities throughout the world. And that's the way it was always done. You have the Sanhedrin, they're waiting, is it going to be a 29-day month, is it going to be a 30-day month, let's wait and see. And... We wait for someone to come, witnesses, we interrogate them. This is an entire book of the Mishnah, well, part of an entire book of the Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah that discusses this, part of the book of Sanhedrin discusses this. This is called Kiddush HaChodesh, Ibra HaChodesh, Kiddush HaShanah, Ibra HaShanah. There's a lot of things that, a lot of terminologies, a lot of complex mathematics, but this was vital, because if we don't have a, a calendar, we don't know when Pesach is, we don't know when circuses, we don't know when to fast for Tisha B'Av, like we don't know anything because it could be one of two days. But for time and memorial, they had a system. And their system was like this. When witnesses come, we interrogate them, right? If we're able to consecrate the month, we announce it, and immediately we can find a way to spread the message everywhere. Then the Mishnah describes what they would do. They would climb on a mountain, and they would take a torches of fire and wave them and send a message for miles and miles and miles away to the next mountain. And then they would see it and they'd all run to the top of the mountain, light a, light a torch and wave and wave and wave it. And one mountain to the other mountain and very, very quickly you could send a message hundreds of miles all the way from Israel to Babylon. That's the way, that's what they always did. Problem was, is that we had a bunch of nefarious actors and the Sadducees, they came to disrupt this. So they would just go rogue and they climb up a mountain and they announce it on their own. And then it, it wasn't based upon the witnesses, it wasn't based upon the announcement, the consecration of the month. They would just go do that just to disrupt this system. And that's how they behaved. And that created a problem. Part of the links in this process was disruptive. So they had to change and they had to make couriers. But by the time it takes a courier to get from, from Jerusalem 
to Babylon, it takes a long time. So that is the beginning of the, pro of the practice of observing two days. We still follow that today. You have two days of the first day of Passover because there were times when the courier didn't make it. So they weren't sure. Is today Pesach? Is tomorrow Pesach? Well, what do you do? If you can't make a decision, you have to do both. And that's where that practice came forward. And the problem now is that there's a lot of war. There's other nefarious actors. There's the Christians and the Romans and all those people. And the couriers is also an inefficient system. So now we're really between a rock and a hard place. What do we do now? And the problem with this is that we cannot essentially rely on mathematics alone because the Torah is very clear that we have to, everything has to stem from the Sanhedrin declaring, consecrating the new month. So what they used to do at this point in history, they kept the mathematics, the mathematics is incredibly detailed and complex, uh, but... They knew the mathematics, but they kind of went away from the system of accepting witnesses. They stopped accepting witnesses. They followed the mathematics for to know when the new month is. But the Sanhedrin in Israel was still consecrating the new month for the rest of the world. Thus, the community of Babylon, they have the Jewish mathematics that we got from Moshe of exactly, precisely the length of the lunar month, which, in case you're curious is 29 days, 12 hours, and 793 chalakim. Well, what's a chalakim? Chalakim means a chela. Chela means a portion. Every hour is not broken down to 60 minutes. It's broken down to 1,080 sections, roughly 18 of them a minute, and about 3.3 .3 seconds each. Thus, in modern-day parlance, a new month, is 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, 3 seconds, and a little bit more than a second. Mm -hmm. Somewhere between 3 and 4 seconds. That we knew. The mathematics we knew. We had a system to follow, and we followed the system as best we could. In Babylon, <coughs> they started using the mathematics, because the mathematics would always align with witnesses. They would use the mathematics and rely on the Sanhedrin in Israel to do the Mekush Mekush, the consecration. But now, the Sanhedrin in Israel, they are on their last days. So they, and well, well, what's to be? The rabbis are all hiding. Many of them have fled to Babylon. Many of them are hiding in caves. Who knows where they are? But they had a window here. And during the time of Julian, they saw that the end, last days of the Masifta in Israel are near. And they took a dramatic step that would make the consecration of the Beit Din unnecessary. Because remember, even if you know exactly when the new month is, the halacha is, unless you have the court declaring it's a new month, it's not valid. So what they did, they got all the rabbis together under the leadership of Hillel II, he was the head of the, he was the Nasi, a descendant of the original Hillel. That's why he called him Hillel II, sometimes called Rabbi Hillel. And they established a perpetual calendar that can go on for eternity until the Messiah comes back. We rebuild the temple, we reestablish the Sanhedrin, we reestablish Smicha, ordination, and we go back to the optimized, the ideal system. But now, what they did is, they took the mathematics, they formalized it, they built a 247-year cycle that continually repeats forever and ever, which, in case you're curious, it's actually 13, 19-year cycles. Each 19-year each cycle has seven leap months, and thus 91 leap months every 247 years. They gave rigid rules as to what, what, which months can be 29, which one of them can be 30, which one have to be 29, which one have to be 30. And thus, they, there and then, consecrated the new months from then until Messiah comes. 
And again, this we don't appreciate this in hindsight because we just get our calendars from the torch calendar on the wall. Like we, mm-hmm. that, that, yeah. that's that's how we know when Rosh Chodesh and Rosh Hashanah and Pas- We don't know, but can you imagine living in Babylon? You don't know. You're you're on your own, and this essentially this moment in time was an opportunity for them to establish uh, a, a calendar that's going to be the baseline for observance of Jewish law thenceforth. Now it's important note to note, this is not very well known, the reason why today in the diaspora, outside of Israel, we observe two days of Passover, it has nothing to do with lack of knowledge. And this is the big misconception. Everyone says this and they're all wrong. It has nothing to do with the fact we don't know is it a 29-day month or a th- We know exactly. In fact, if we didn't know, we should fast two days for Yom Kippur, right? How can we don't fast two days Yom Kippur? The answer is we do know precisely when the new month is because we're following the mathematical system established by Hill and Second. But the reason why is, the reason why we still maintain the Yom Tov Sheni, the second day of the holiday, was because for hundreds of years already, in Babylon, they had grown accustomed to keeping two days. Therefore, Hillel II and his Sanhedrin, they made a decision, a decision that's binding until today, to not tamper with what the other communities in the world have accepted and established for hundreds of years. And therefore they said, from now on, in Israel, which we always kept one day, we keep one day. In Babylon, which we always kept two days, we keep two days, and nothing to do with not knowing which is the new month, only as a result of the custom that was accepted amongst all those people. So if someone tells you today, well, I don't need to keep two days of Pesach, because that was all important. No, that's not true. The reason we keep it as Pesach is because of the custom that was concretized by the Sanhedrin of Hillel II. It has nothing to do with lack of knowledge. We know exactly when Pesach is, but there is a mitzvah to keep the second days, and that was established by the Sanhedrin in the power vested in them by the Almighty in Deuteronomy, that they, what they say becomes the law of the land for the Jews. Now, Julian died after just two years, and when he died, the Christians redoubled their efforts of reading Israel of Jews and of Torah. From that point forward, uh, at least for the next 1,200 years, smicha is not going to be conferred. Now, the reason why I say 1,200 years is because the halacha is that if the majority of the Jews, in, of the rabbis in Israel, decide to reestablish smicha and to reestablish the Sanhedrin, not majority, sorry, if all the rabbis accept, uh, accept the position to reestablish smicha and Sanhedrin, then they're allowed to do that. So in the 1500s, there was an effort to reestablish smicha and the Sanhedrin, but it didn't really go far. Even though there were three people that did receive smicha, most notably Rabbi Yosef Cairo, the author of the Shulchan Aruch and the Bet Yosef. But besides for that one brief period in history, there has not been smicha from that point in history, in the middle of the 4th century, around 359, 360, forward. The Sanhedrin is to have its doors shuttered. And again, most critically, the Mesifta in Israel is no longer going to be uh, in existence. Israel, which had been an almost uninterrupted bastion of Torah greatness, is now going to be the place where the Torah scholars as individuals can flourish, but Torah for the masses is uh, a thing of the past, until, of course, uh, this century, the 20th century, where Israel, again, is going to become the epicenter of Torah greatness. What happens when the door closes in one area, the door opens elsewhere. With the sun of the Torah community in Israel setting, there's going to be an explosion of Torah greatness and Torah opportunity in Babylon, and it's going to be a sanctuary for the great scholars. They're all going to just go there. They're going to take their passports and head across to the Arabian Desert 
and reestablish themselves there. Now, there's a tremendous silver lining to this sad story. Previously, we had a splinter, not splintered, but geolo- or geographically splintered Mesifta. We had half of the scholars in Israel, half of them in Babylon. Sometimes there would be a shift and a trend one way, and then a shift and a trend the other way. But we don't have all of the scholars of Israel under one roof. Now we're going to have that. Because Israel is no longer hospitable to the Mesifta, all the sages are going to travel to Babylon and reestablish there. There's going to be an effort undertaken in Bavel, in Babylon, and namely the codification and finalization of the Babylonian Talmud. Arguably, the greatest Herculean human effort, human project of all time. And it's going to be bolstered, or the project is going to be bolstered by the existence of all the sages of Israel under one roof. All the sages that were previously in Israel, some of them were in Israel, some of them are all going to converge. And under the leadership of tremendous visionaries and scholars, they're going to undertake this effort to write down the entirety of the Babylonian Talmud. It's a work that's going to consist of 2,711 pages, which doesn't sound like a lot. It sounds like a really, really long, maybe, trilogy. But if you take into account that the fastest people could possibly study a single page is in an, is in an hour, and even then it's just skimming the surface. And uh, when you take into account that a metric, one of the metrics of who's a Torah scholar. What's the metric? How do we know who's a Torah scholar? Well, a great Torah scholar is someone who could study 40 pages of Talmud in one day and simultaneously can spend 40 days studying a single solitary page of Talmud. Someone of tremendous intellect that can swallow up Vast swaths of Talmud, 40 pages in a single day. Unbelievable. I don't know anyone who, who could do that. That same person with the same mental acuity and uh, capability can find 40 days worth in a single page of Talmud. The Talmud is an unbelievable project. It's unimaginable. And a silver lining to the horrors of the death and the setting of the Masifta in Israel is going to be that now the greatest minds that this world has ever seen are all going to be coalesced in relatively peaceful and amenable conditions and they are going to work together. The giants of Babel, together with the giants of Israel, are going to work together to produce the greatest man-made contribution uh, that the world has ever seen. And next week we look forward to to analyzing the great sages of Bavel, because during this time, when the Jewish, when in the thir- fourth century, when there's so much chaos in Israel, there's relative tranquility in Bavel, and personalities that are titanic, towering personalities are going to arise in Bavel, namely Abaya and Rava and Rabba and Rabbi Yosef, names that appear thousands of times in the Talmud, tremendous contributors to the corpus of Jewish learning, and of course, Ravina and Ravashi, who are going to take this all together and build the edifice of the Babylonian Talmud. And I will take questions right now. When when you said there was no Shmicha after um, the 1,200 years, you're not saying that no rabbis were ordained. Yes, so the the rabbinate today, it's... um, it's called smicha. I have smicha. I have multiple smichas. It has the same name, uh, but it's the in name only. Uh, it's, it, the real smicha that would allow someone to be part of the Sanhedrin meant that someone knew everything about everything. Everything. Uh, today, it's kind of like this uh, piecemeal smicha. If you know a little sliver of Torah will give you smicha, you could be a rabbi, okay? I have many questions, if I may be permitted to. Go ahead. Where did the sages live during their time when they were reviewing the Talmud? What was their source of income? What was the approximate 
population of Babylon at the time. And when did having Smita confirmed upon a person end? And, and I think you answered that by saying, we don't have anybody today. Is, that, is there anyone who can confer, or any group that can confer Smita on anybody? Are we working towards that? So my curiosity is, how did, it's kind of like the people developing the Constitution. Where did you get your income from? You know, philosophers are really basically entertainers of the court or rich people. Where are these people getting... So many of those questions. So there's a lot of questions there. Um, where they lived, they lived, um, some of them traveled, some of them um, lived in one place and studied in the other place, <coughs> and they would have commitment that's something we can't even fathom. They would go and study for eight years straight and come back, you know, maybe on Pesach, maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, study 18 hours a day, uh, only sleep on a, on a bed, maybe never, but, you know, like Rabbi Jew the Prince, never slept on a bed, never. Uh, the people are, are definitely committed. Some of them were very wealthy, some of them were very poor. It's a mix. Some of them worked on the side, some of them um, had generational wealth. They, they, and, of course, there's a lot of stories about this, like Rav Huna, for example. We'll maybe talk about him next week. Rav Huna was someone who was very poor, and everything he tried, he wasn't successful. Uh, and then Rav saw him, he gave him a blessing, and he became very, 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 very wealthy. So wealthy that he would ride a wagon that was made of solid gold. Okay. With, with so, regard, go ahead. I'm sorry, with regard to the calendar? Yes. Um, this is a very complex set of uh, mathematical tools that was used. Yes. Was there some kind of structure? In other words, is there something similar to the Aztec calendar? No. Yeah. So the, this is not supposed to anything else, and it wasn't. It was a mathematical calculation, but they didn't calculate it mathematically. They did it because they got it from Moshe. Moshe told them, "This is how long a lunar month is," and he got it from God. Okay. Do we have anybody in Israel that, that establishes the calendar today? Oh no, we're still working with the same system. Fantastic. We have. We have not changed it. Why change a good thing, right? Exactly. We have not not tinkered with or with it at all. It doesn't need to be changed and improved. How were the Sanhedrin chosen? Who? What was the procedure? Who chose them? They. So first of all, Sanhedrin was comprised of seventy-one members, mm -hmm. but there were also there's something called Sanhedrin Gadola and Sanhedrin Katana, which means a large Sanhedrin, seventy-one members, and a small Sanhedrin. 23 members in the uh, permanent dwelling place of the Sanhedrin Gadola, of the large Sanhedrin, there were also three Sanhedrin Katanas. So the total amount of scholars in the room was 140. It was 71 plus 69, i.e. three groups of 23. Now, th those were like the minor leaves. Those were apprentices, even though these were the greatest sages of the world. Mm -hmm. They were the apprentices. And the way it worked is, when someone died in the Sanhedrin, everyone moved up a slot. And then the person who was the most veteran from the apprentices, who spent the most time, who was moved up 69 slots, they were the ones who were brought up to the Sanhedrin to join. Now, of course, that was a way of, not only you would take the greatest scholar to fill the void left, but also the person who was raised from being a member of the minor Sanhedrin to the major Sanhedrin to the supreme Sanhedrin, that person had spent the longest time in apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. How they selected people from the crowd, they I, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I would assume Sanhedrin themselves did it because those were the greatest scholars and they would probably interview candidates and find the greatest Torah scholar mm -hmm. out there and he's next in line to take the most minor of the most minor seats and then make their way up and maybe make, a, uh, make it there to a slot on the major Sanhedrin. You stated that the Jews in the north were obliterated when the, by the Christians and the Romans. Yes. What does that mean? Does that mean the whole population was gone? Does that mean a portion of the Massacres. So, how, so the ones in the south were left There weren't any Jews in the south. Or the south Jews haven't been living in the south for hundreds of years. So everybody in the north was obliterated. Well, I'm saying fun, there were some survivors hiding out. Uh, but functionally, the communities were destroyed. Okay. You know, uh, if there were some survivors, of course, there were some survivors, but 
but not significant numbers, not like uh, now, of, uh, viable from communities. From that time, how long was it till they all till they went to Babylon? Oh well, it was already happening. It was already happening, but that was, you know, that really was the major turning point. That was, you know, un, you know, it was not possible to undo. It was a point of no return. Now, uh, you, you said something like when they were doing the torches and, and then the Sadducees screwed that up. Um, now, at that time, you also said before, like just before. Uh, that the Sadducees were screwing around with the Sanhedrin as well. This is before, or this is after when they put the, the fake uh, people. They they were trying to. It was the Sadducees. It was the Baitusim. It was uh, th these people were pranksters. They were pranking the temple when the temple was in existence. They they haven't stopped doing that. Um, it, I think actually a correction is due. It wasn't the Sadducees. It was Sadducee light. It was the Baitusim. Same same kind of group. Same ideology. Different name. The problem with the Sanhedrin. How were they supported? Did they have just the communities? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I would assume that maybe once someone got Sanhedrin, that's a job. They were they they were an employee of the Jewish nation, and they would be supported by the nation. That's what I would assume. I would assume as well that once someone became over ahead of the Masifta, they too got a stipend. Uh, but the average scholar wa did not. That's why Hillel, before he becomes the great scholar, he is on the roof listening in because he was not allowed entrance and uh, he didn't wasn't given a stipend or he didn't refuse to take a stipend. That's actually a matter of hot debate uh, because... Did they not want to take a stipend? Were they not allowed to take a stipend? There are sources that say that they were very, very resistant. The rabbis themselves, they hated the idea of getting any 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 stipends. They didn't want to get paid for Torah study. Mm -hmm. So they would work on the side. They would have some side hustles. Mm -hmm. um, or they would live in poverty. But they believed, in line with the words of the Mishnah, do not make the Torah a crown to be glorified, nor a shovel to dig with. You shouldn't use your Torah study for your own personal benefit. And therefore, they resisted the notion that because I'm a Torah scholar, people should pay me. But I would surmise that if someone was a member of the Sanhedrin, they're actually in an official capacity in the job, they would get paid for that. Do we have any clue as to when the Babylonian Talmud revised edition will begin and when there may be a potential publication date? Uh, of the, the Babylonian? The, the new one that you anticipate? No, oh, well, no, the Babylonian Talmud is good. You mean the Jerusalem Talmud? Do you mean the Jerusalem Talmud? No, the Jerusalem Talmud, I think, is that poor thing. Wait, you want to update the Babylonian Talmud? Babylonian Talmud was 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 finalized and okay. polished. It's it's a polished work. That's fine. Now, now I'm okay. Yeah, it's polished. Yeah, oh yeah, it's it's scintillating. Yes, it is. It it doesn't need any any help from us. Okay, I misunderstood. At all. Thank you. Okay, you can't write the you can't write more Talmud. The, the Talmud that you said that wasn't pol polished. That's the Jerusalem one. Yes, it's called the Jerusalem one. But remember, the Jews were not living in Jerusalem. It's called the Jerusalem one because they still remember Jerusalem. It was written actually in the Galilee, probably in Tiberias. But they call it the Jerusalem Talmud because it was. It's sometimes called the Palestinian Talmud, which is a joke because they're trying to make it, um, you know. Uh, but it means it was written in Israel. It was actually written in, in, in northern Israel, but they still called it uh, Jerusalem Talmud to is remember there Jerusalem. Any hope to well, it's no, we were not capable of doing that. We're not a Moriah. Um, but it, it's, it's, I'm saying, I, I'm, we're overdoing how haphazard it is, right? It still was written by men of great capabilities with boundless resources of, of intellect. Uh, but compared to the Babylonian Talmud, we always follow the Babylonian Talmud. And it's still used, it's still used. But whenever there is a conflict in the two, we always follow the Babylonian Talmud. Okay, I look forward to, look to next week. Next week we're going to get, dive into the great giants of Babylon and the writing of the Mishnah. 
and then we'll probably, we may, we may, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not promising anything, but we may get into a little uh, time travel capsule <laughs> and shoot 50, 500 years into the future. Thank you. Yes, thank you all.